Hey, everybody. Welcome to the second episode of EDU Live, um, the monthly LinkedIn Live series that I get the pleasure of hosting, uh, where I can have conversations with dynamic guests like my one today, uh, Lynn Wooten, who's the president of Simmons, to talk about issues of equity, access, opportunity, and higher ed. Um, so we're going to talk for about 35 minutes, uh, and then we're going to leave some time at the end for questions. So I encourage you all to put questions in the chat. Um, and with that, I let, Lynn, let's uh, dig in. First of all, um, I know you've had a very busy week. You had a huge event uh, yesterday, the Simmons Women's Leadership uh, Conference, which has been going on for a, a bunch of years. I definitely want to spend some time talking about that. But where I want to start, um, I always like to start with a, a question about kind of a little bit of your origin story. So tell us uh, where you're from, um, where you grew up, uh, and uh, kind of where your passion for education came from. Yeah, you know, my origin start story started in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And when I think about the theme of this show, access and education and, and growing up in Philly, born in 66, you know, educated in school in the 70s and the 80s, Philadelphia is a, um, a place where I started Philadelphia Public School to segregate. And by the time oh, wow. I got to elementary school, there was this massive integration of access. And that really shaped who I am. My parents were first generation college students and knew how education had changed their life. So really dri drilled in education. And I'm the only child. So I, they only had one experiment to keep on to emphasize this education. My mother was a school teacher too. So at some point in elementary school, she decided she wanted to put me in private school for a few years. So went to one of the few black private schools at that time. And then Philadelphia had this system where, you know, they had magnet schools. And so from fifth to 12th grade went to magnet schools ironically went to a all girls high school, an all girls public okay. high school that was a magnet school. And that really taught me the importance of women's leadership and empowerment. The other thing, you know, I, I see Will Smith on the Fresh Prince and he talks about born and raised in West Philadelphia. I'm, I'm from Northwest Philly is that um, Philadelphia was a city where it was a great playground for a young adult. You know, I learned how to catch the subway at 10 I had the integration of everything was at the art museum and the Franklin Institute and all of those type of things. The Philadelphia Zoo were a part of my identity, just exploring Philadelphia and its history and its shopping district. And then Philadelphia is, you know, home to a lot of founding of black organizations, the AME Church, Jack and Jill, the Lynx, a lot of different organizations. So this strong black community in Philadelphia helped to raise me too. And this is back when people hadn't flown to the suburbs. So you were just all one big melting pot in the city. And uh, how, how'd you end up at North Carolina a and I mean, what, tell me the, so the journey. So I, you know, that's an interesting story. I, I thought I was gonna be a home economics major, checked off accounting on my PSAT form. And my father was really frugal. My first choice was when I was gonna to go to Georgetown and be a county major and be in DC and hang out with my friends who were going to Howard. And a and found me through the PSAT search. <laughs> and when they told my parents they were gonna give me a full scholarship and they were known for producing the most black CPAs, my parents told me I was going. There you go. And that's how I hand, ended up at North Carolina a and really, you know, you think about the year I started college was 84. We had a transformational dean. His name was Dean Weister Fred. And he wanted to change the field and diversify business back in the 80s. And the way he did that was one, he attracted the best students from all over the country. And that was unusual because most North Carolina schools have lots of North Carolina residents. Yeah. And secondly, he got corporate sponsorship. So the accounting firms and the big corporations were very involved and gave him scholarship money. And he also knew about legitimacy and the accreditation body for business schools is the AACSB. And he worked his way up, to become the president of that organization so he could put historically black colleges on the map. So a and is Thanks. how I ended up in Greensboro for four years. It's funny, you know, last week or last month, I'm sorry, when I had, you know, President Thomas on as my guest, who I know you know and was a mentor of yours and probably still is and, and of mine, I, I commented on the fact that like, he has like three or four degrees. You also have a total of three degrees. So you obviously went on, got your MBA at Duke and uh, got your PhD at Michigan. I, I guess, you know, 
when you think about that journey as a business leader and an academic, at, you know, at what stage in your career did you feel like your passion around business and your passion around access and equity, that you could bring those two together and create a career as a academic? So it's interesting. When I started, I kind of knew I wanted to be an academic. My father's sister's an academic, but I wasn't committed to it. I thought I'd get an accounting degree at a and and then go into corporate law, but I love school. I came to college in 84 and never left. So I, so any way I could find to stay in college, it, we joke about, I found ways. I left a and and went straight to Duke, the Fuqua School of Business to get my MBA. I did an internship at GE Capital where I traded mortgage securities, but I still liked being at a university better than corporate America. So then went on to Michigan where I met my husband to do my PhD. And that is really when I started to think about access and equity in education. As a PhD student, you normally teach one class and I taught the senior core corporate strategy course. For many of my students at a large university like University of Michigan, it has probably about 12,000 undergrads. I was the first black professor they had. Wow. And so starting to think about that and then when I would look at the landscape of business education in particular at top predominantly white institutions, you look at a class, less than 5% of your students are from underrepresented backgrounds. That is when the light bulb started to go off on the student side about access and equity. In addition, David, I did my PhD in the mid nineties and Workforce 2000 and diversity and equity issues were becoming important as the Workforce 2000 report said that the demographics of workers were gonna change. And so my earlier research from a strategic management perspective started to look, how can you change your organizational culture for diverse workforces? And in particular, a lot of it looked at what does it mean to be a woman friendly company in my earlier research. That's great. So let's talk a little bit about, um, cause a lot of your academic research, um, obviously the conference that is now kind of an anchor part of, you know, Simmons as an institution is really around, you know, women's leadership and leadership and being a diverse, uh, equitable, inclusive leader. So talk, uh, first of all, a little bit about, um, you know, your philosophy around um, leadership and particularly some of the themes I've heard you talk about before, which again, resonate, I think, to some of the conversation we had a month ago about resilience, uh, leading through crisis, because uh, then I want to talk about your transition to uh, becoming president of Simmons in the in literally in the middle of a, of a global pandemic. So, you know, my general philosophy is leadership is one is that it's this lifelong life wide journey of learning. And this is why I like partnering with to you so much because it speaks to who to you is. And so to be an extraordinary leader, you have to constantly invest in learning. The world is changing and it's so important. I also believe my philosophy about leadership is showing up to be your best self. So you lead with your strengths and then you achieve competitive parity for everything else you need to do in your leadership journey. But the way you're going to shine is with your strengths. The next component of my leadership philosophy is, is that your job is not all about yourself. It's, empower, it's to empower others to be their best self. You know, part of being a leader, and Krista and I have talked about this on your team, is that you got to be a choreographer. You, have, you got to help the team come together so that the team can be just as good as the individuals or even better on it. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think we all go into leadership and each of us do this in our individual everyday leadership practices because some way or another, we want to use our given talents and strengths to make the world a better place, to give back, to be servant leaders. So that's yeah. my philosophy about leadership. And let me ask you, Lynn, you know, I, I have... On, my, on a personal level and you know, a lot of my friends and you know, as, as we've kind of moved into that stage in our careers where you know, we have peers and friends who are leaders, um, like the process of recognizing what your strengths are as a leader, like maybe talk a little bit about your own journey in that. Yeah. Um, you know, Cause there's a difference between you know, being a great classroom teacher and somebody who decides, you know what, I may, maybe I want to run this institution one day or right. I want to be, uh, uh, so talk, talk a little bit about that journey and, and how you think about that leadership philosophy and your ability to then help create greater access and opportunity in higher ed. You know, knowing your own strengths is doing the inner work 
and then listening to what the world is telling you. And so I'm constantly, as a leader, and I know other leaders, reflecting on where are my shrimps? Where can I show up to be the best I contribute? And so I knew, for example, you know, if you talk to anybody who knew me in high school, and especially my a and classmates, you know, I was a bookworm. I like to learn, I like to study those concepts, you know, my sorority sisters, they still talk about that to this day. So I knew learning and teaching were my strengths. I could always teach someone. I was the child who the blackboard was my favorite toy and I'd be teaching all the neighborhood kids on the step in Philadelphia. So learning and teaching, I knew were my strengths. Um, and so, so, but the inner side also is listening to what other people say. I built a career around research and teaching and at each promotion after I had been promoted, people would tap me and say, you know what? I think you're a leader. I think you could be good at administration. And we know women have a tendency to say no when they're promoted or asked to be a leader. And so there were people who sponsored, who mentored, who coached me to say, you can take this next leap. Don't say no, but instead say, what do you need to be successful? And so part of it is knowing your strengths and then thinking about how you want to use those strengths in your leadership stage. And who else do you need to help you? Because leadership is not a solo hack. I mean, I truly believe in the African proverb, if you want to go fast, you can go alone. If you want to go far, you have to go with other people. And throughout my leadership journey, I am so grateful for all the people who were on the stage with me who helped me get to where I am. So when you made the pivot from primarily classroom into becoming a dean and, and made the move to, to Cornell, I guess, talk a little bit about, I guess, what I say to people, I think it's conceptually a similar construct is um, when you take a new job and it's a stretch assignment, there's going to be a shallow end of the pool and there's going to be a deep end of the pool. Right. And you have to be honest with yourself about like, you know, what portion of the job is the shallow end and what portion is the deep end. And you want both of those because if the whole pool is shallow, you're not really stretching yourself. So you're not, maybe you're talk not, a little you're bit. You're not stretching yourself. So for me is, you know, when I was at the Ross School of Business, because Michigan is a decentralized university, I had seen a lot. I understood what it takes to lead and be a business school dean. I was senior associate dean there. So understanding how to lead a business school in some ways when I got to Cornell, that was the shallow end. But David, so often we forget about the soft skills. I had been at Michigan 19 years. And my PhD was there. So think about, I knew every nook and cranny of the university. I had built up social capital. I had created a high performance team. So some of the deep end was learning the culture at Cornell, how they did things, building a new team and thinking of ways to introduce innovation into the curriculum and the leadership practices. That was the deep end because if you've been somewhere in 19 years, you know the place and to start new and to not only move your career, but move your family. That's jumping into the deep end. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, all right, so let's let's shift to more of the now. Um, you know, you're you obviously are the you know first black president of Simmons University. Um, when you got that phone call, and I'm sure you got plenty of them about, hey, you know, we're doing a search for a new president. Um, tell me a little bit about what was it about Simmons? Um, that made you feel like it was the place where, you know, you could both take on the next challenge and tell me a little bit about uh, what excites you about uh, right. Simmons and its alignment with your philosophy and the student body and, and what it means from the mission orientation and history of Simmons. You know, so you're right, David, you and I know that you get lots of phone calls and in higher education in particular, people, when you move up, change jobs pretty frequently. Simmons had, I had talked to Simmons earlier in my career, so I knew something about them. They were recruiting me for a chaired professorship. One of my graduate school classmates was on the faculty there. And then my mentor, one of my mentors, Deborah Britton, was alum. So I knew about the great things Simmons had done. I also knew about Simmons' mission. You know, Simmons was founded in 1899 because John Simmons wanted to create a university that women could earn an independent livelihood. He made his money through the ready-made suit. Imagine that back in, you know, the 1800s. And he saw how women had worked in his manufacturing plants and he wanted his legacy to be that women could go to college and be educated. And throughout the last 120 or so years, Simmons University has built upon that legacy to think about what would it look like. Um, we started with the traditional women 
um, things like home economics and secretarial science and library science and nursing. And it's evolved over the history of Simmons. And in particular, it's evolved in a lot of different ways. Simmons was the first place that used, we used to have um, a women's MBA program. We have our world renowned leadership conference. We are experts in library science. Um, when you look at our communications department, Gwen Ifo and Rahima Ellis are alumni of our communications department. So Simmons has always had this role in society of educating women to bridge the liberal arts with professional education and empowering them to be leaders in their career. And that it had spoke to me, that's what I had done all of my career. And so when the headhunter called, I was really excited. Now I didn't know a pandemic was coming. It was <laughs> normal like every other time since 1984, but I was just excited because of who Simmons was, where it was located and how it's contributed to society. You know, since our founding, we've evolved and our graduate education programs have grown more and we have a robust online portfolio too. But Simmons still is to that mission of empowering women for leadership in their careers. Well, you know, um, obviously it is Women's History Month. And I mean, and one, one of the things I would love to just d dig in a little bit about is, you know, tell me about the, the student body and tell me about, um, because I, I know obviously you are a proud alum of an HBCU, right? right. So you, you know the impact that HBCUs have had in terms of creating access and opportunity for you know, lots of folks that look like us. But you know, I was also struck when I got a chance to meet you as you were coming on as president and learning about you know, the diversity of, of the classes that are coming in first gen women from, it was re really compelling. So talk a little bit about what you are doing as an institution yeah. to meet this moment. Well, if you look at our undergraduate class in particular, Simmons is really special that half of our incoming class of this year's first year students are women of color, half are first gen, and about 30% are what we call Pell eligible. So really Simmons has become a place where access, equity, diversity, inclusion are important. I think women of this demographic are attracted to Simmons because they can see a, a return on their investment. And they know that Simmons places people for successful careers when you look at our alum and you look at our programs such as business and nursing and communication and social work. But really what we're doing is if I think about why my experience at a and was so successful and what we see as HBCUs and colleges that transform lives is, is that we're making investments in the student experience. And we know from research that there are certain things that produce equity in the student experience. One, you need to know that someone on that campus cares about you. It could be a faculty or a staff member. And that is so important. So every Simmons student has an academic advisor and they have what I call a professional staff advisor. Having these transformational learning experiences, you know, learning experiences such as capstone courses. We have this planned curriculum that's really designed so that every semester there's some type of transformational experience. For example, first semester, we start with our Boston class, a small seminar. So I might be a young woman and I'm taking the Boston class and I'm bringing politicians, women politicians in from Boston, learning about the Boston experience and what it means to lead from a political science viewpoint. So that's important. Career readiness is important and making sure that that is taken care of. Having a friend at college, so ensuring networks of friends. And then developing as a leader through the co-curriculars are so important. When I reflect upon my own undergrad experience, I learned just as much in the classroom as I did from my co-curricular activities in who I am today. That's great. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about the conference, which I, as I alluded to earlier was yesterday, um, which makes me even more thankful that you were willing to spend some time with me today because I know you were you were on stage and running this amazing t t tell us a little bit about how long it's been going on because you know obviously a lot there's a lot going on these days around women's leadership but Simmons was really at the table literally yeah. and figuratively early on and then a, a little bit about um, you know I know you gave a sp speech yesterday talking about uh, resilience and the S curve and leadership. So right. t tell us what some of the key takeaways were from this year's conference and why so you're so inspired. This is our by um, 42nd year having a conference and you're right. We were in the business of women leadership conference before anyone else. It's amazing. You know, Previous speakers have been Michelle Obama. Last year we had Serena. 
This year, the keynote, we had Mindy Hart and Jenna Bush. And so we get these keynote speakers that really share inspiration from their leadership journey. This year, the focus areas were about being resilient and being authentic. And we had a lineup of speakers who talked about that. Since my research is in crisis leadership, I paired with Whitney Johnson to discuss resiliency as it relates to the S curve. And what better year for women's leaders to think about resiliency than living in a global pandemic? And not only a global health pandemic, but the ones we're seeing with economic uncertainty and racial reckoning. So my own research on resilience with my co-author, Dean Erica James, looks at kind of this notion that, you know, resiliency starts really with fear, acknowledging that we're having this traumatic situation and that it's going to happen. You know, you're going to deny it. You're going to hoard her resources. You're going to be paralyzed. You have fear, but you can't live in the fear mode when you're doing something new and there's change in your life. So the next phase of our model talks about this notion of you got to take a pause and engage in reflective sense making, understanding what's happening in your world. Um, David, you and I never lived through a pandemic before. So we had to take a long pause to say, how do I do work in a pandemic? How do I raise kids? How do I get groceries? All of those type of things, reflective sense making. I often say in that reflective sense making is kind of three, you know, 360. You got to look back to see what you can learn. This is not the first pandemic we've had, 1918, so we can learn from that. You have to look forward to understand where the world is going. And then you also have to do the inner and outer work as you're going through this reflective sense making. After you've had time to sense make, you got to ask yourself, what do I need to learn in this new reality as a woman leader when I'm trying to be resilient? And learning comes, you know, I always say, have a theory of change and then take, what are you going to need to enact the change? What do I need to study? What um, books do I need to read? Maybe what courses do I need to take? What people do I need to involve to go out and take on the role? And then finally, resilience is, you know, getting out there and having the fortitude to lead and, you know, going back to Hamilton, take your shot, try it in this new world, go forth with courage and fortitude and practice on that stage through prototyping and experimenting and surrounding yourself with a strong supported cast. And what we heard from the feedback of the women is, you know, women are feeling tired in this pandemic. They are um, taking care of a lot of the caring responsibilities. They're balancing many things and they're working. They're starting to question their careers. And so my co-presenter, Whitney Johnson, talked about this S-curve. And then through life, we're always jumping S-curves. We start with a soft launch, something new. As you, you, know, you mentioned when I went from Michigan to Cornell, we then have to go to the mastery, kind of the sweet spot stage where we're learning and we're doing and we're hitting that sweet spot the best. And then at some point we get to mastery. And a lot of times when we get to mastery, then we may jump to a new S curve. I found this tool empowering because women are sometimes scared to take the leap. You know, men will take a job. And this is research. This is not me. It might be. Men will take a job. They say, oh, I can only do 50%, but I'll learn it. I'll fake it when I make it. Um, but women want to be able to do 90% of the job before they take a new job. And so the S curve really helps us map out how do we get to mastery? How do we get to launch in the sweet spot? And what investments do I need to make along that curve so that I can feel confident as a woman leader? And I'm hoping from the conference yesterday, lots of people saw that so we don't have those leaky pipelines we're seeing in the C various C-suites. Yeah. Let's talk for you, uh, two occasions during the course of this conversation, you've talked about the importance of like the support network that you have. So tell me a little bit about, you know, one of the things you and I talked about um, in the past is how much um, kind of our generation of leaders have needed to kind of rely upon our peers because there haven't been that many. Um, right. First, I mean, you know, when, when that release came out about you becoming the president of Simmons of the first year, one of your best friends had just become the dean of, of Wharton's business school. There's the right. first Black female mayor of Boston today. So th those are all wonderful accomplishments, but like talk a little bit about that peer network and how important that has been to the resilience, to the, you know, leading in difficult times, to the S curve, um, you know, willing to make the jump. Yeah, you know, there's the uh, this, this song, if I had to write my life story over again, what would I say? And I definitely would have to give kudos to my peer network. David, you and I talked about, you know, we're, Generation X. And if anybody, if you know anything about Generation X, we are the, the latchkey 
middle child generation. We're the generation where people basically raised themselves and they let us go. You know, they didn't care if we played all night till the street lights went off. You know, you got to explore cities. And so you learned how to learn from your peers. Your peers were checking balances. They mentored you, they encouraged you. And so throughout every aspect, if I was creating a life map and I think about my days at Philadelphia Girls High and what I learned from the peers there and sitting in the lunchroom cafeteria, I go to A&T and think about what I learned from my peers there in my dorm room and my accounting friends and my sorority sisters. And then, you know, I skip to the PhD program and think about what I learned through my peers, you know, how to write a dissertation and, and play cards at the same time. All of those were peer <laughs> mentor groups that really taught and nurtured me on the professional and personal side. And so as we discussed, David, we had kind of the generation before us who opened the door and role modeled for us. And then we had our peers who were our village and helped us to have that fortitude to be resilient. We, you know, we took care of each other. We showed the ropes, especially when you're a woman of color, having a diverse group of peers to learn from has been so valuable for me. And, um, and then, you know, in the pandemics, I've had to kind of zoom it with my peers because you don't get to see people as person, but still learning from totally. them has been important. No doubt. So um, I think we're going to pivot uh, for the next few minutes into some questions. And so I guess the first question is, you know, as we've talked about a bit, you, you have written about crisis leadership, and then you step into the role as the president of this, you know, university, literally, you know, a month or so before this global pandemic. Talk a little bit about the, the kind of applied self uh, actualization of your own crisis leadership um, kind of playbook during the moments of making the transition of, you know, all of this madness at a time that no one could have predicted and no one's ever really been through before. I think I'm going to have to uh, coin that term applied self actualization, right? So it had spent, you know, 20 years writing about crisis leadership, took the job six weeks before the pandemic, and then you're like, oh my. So I know what the fear mode looks like. You know, we, we have to go on functioning in a university, and I was still in my Cornell role. So um, the first thing that I learned is the importance of taking a pause and giving people time, my team and individuals to sense make how I'm going to live in this global pandemic. How do I balance, you know, sharing a computer with a child or homeschool and all those type of things. So pausing on the personal level and then at the work level, the things I was doing at Cornell and preparing for my presidency of Simon is like, what is a university going to look like? We don't want to shut down the university. We want to keep operations going. So how do we provide those transformational learning experiences for our students? And you know, thanks to, to you, we were able to pivot very quickly online and provide a high quality education. So that was important, the safety and the well-being. And once we got to map out the safety and well-being, we had to also think about, okay, what does the system have to do differently? Everything from rethinking the academic calendar, to how we engage in orientation and bring people on board were all important things. Who do we bring on campus? How do we manage remote work in this environment were the important things. So this learning, this theory of change that I mentioned earlier came into play and mapping it out. So lots of team meetings, lots of Zoom time. And the big part of crisis leadership is communicate, communicate, communicate. And then the next phase is um, the world is not going back to the same. This comes back to this courage and fortitude to show up on the stage when the world is changing in a crisis situation. And asking yourself, okay, where can I see opportunities in this crisis? And given the opportunities I see, Simmons has been saying, where do we bet on for the future? For the yeah. sustainable future are so important. So that's a good segue into the next question, which I think is a little bit about you know, you've obviously had a perspective at a variety of different institutions now. You've been in higher ed for, you know, your, you know the lion's share of your professional career. Right. Um, like, we're at this moment, as you mentioned, you know, we had a bit of a racial reckoning. This, like, where are the places when you sit now as the president of an institution that is serving a lot of first gen, you know, students of color, where, where's the opportunity to improve and to really put um, some points on the board in terms of moving higher ed in a direction where it, it can serve, um, you know, historically, 
you know, underserved communities, not just while they're 18 to 22, but, you know, throughout that right. lifelong learning right. cycle that you said we're all going to have to go through. There are definitely so many opportunities. As you said, I've spent all of my adult life in higher ed. And in your recent years, I've been a consumer of it by having to pay tuition for two children. So I have thought a lot <laughs> about where there are improvements for higher ed as it relates to access, equity, and the quality of product that we're delivering. Um, first of all, is higher ed's got to partner with K-12. K-12 has to do the job of making sure that we have students who understand what their opportunities are beyond college and the multiple pathways and making sure that they're ready for adulthood. So we need to see more partnership with K-12. And in my own life, I've tried to do that in the various forms. Going to the question of improvements for higher ed is we have to create an environment given that people are coming from different backgrounds, under-resourced and underrepresented backgrounds where everybody can thrive. And if you look at higher ed on the faculty side, the landscape has changed a lot. We have faculty people who have been teaching a long time and it's a different world now. And how do they create spaces of belonging where if you have learning differences or you have social economic differences or any type of differences that they can thrive. So everything I think is so important now that we didn't have when you and I were college, the, the, the expansion of mental health and well-being initiatives. The need yeah. to make sure that you have tutorial support and peer mentoring and peer coaching are all important, but we have to have these safe and brave spaces for our students. Also, I think higher ed needs to be more intentional about its calling to help students go from adolescence to adulthood. And that looks different with each generation. And what is that going to take so that we can assure they're viable members? The other one I've been thinking a lot about and we've been talking about is there's so many people who drop out of higher ed because yeah. of various financial reasons, caretaking reasons, maybe it's maturity. And so Simmons is really excited that we've just launched complete degree for women who really want to restart their higher education. And I believe that this is an opportunity to partner with lots of corporations who employ women because women are you know, more likely to drop out and want to finish their degree. And how do we ensure that everyone has that opportunity to finish their degree in a way and really position them to be successful for career? And so this is really something that is very important to me. I've seen the value of the complete degree programs for family members. And I want everyone who maybe had to drop out of college to have this experience. Yeah, then, you know, in a, in a moment when you think about the number of women who are dropping out of the workforce because of the right. pandemic and thinking about what's the pathway back if they want to re-enter, it's, you know, no doubt a meaningful opportunity there to make a difference and move the dial. So we're going to take two more questions. Um, the next, I guess, is you've talked at a high level about mentors, but are there one or two people in particular um, throughout the course of your career uh, who have been of particular uh, impact as mentors um, or sponsors in your um Journey. So you'll hear me talk about mentorship as a constellation of mentors, and I've had a lot of them. And you'll hear me talk about having this personal board of directors. And so there are various mentors. I can think of Cornell's current president, President Martha Pollack, who was provost when I was at Michigan. Um, her mentorship and sponsorship, one was she was always someone who was good at giving advice. She mm -hmm. helped me see higher ed from a finance lens and gave me opportunities to serve on committees, to chair committees, to do special projects for her that really prepared me to be prepared for my presidency and my deanship. So she was kind of what we call a multiplier in leadership, identifying talent and thinking about what the need is to develop that particular talent. So was my colleague, um, Allison Davis Blake, who's the former president of Bentley University and that she encouraged me to take that S-curve and to jump S-curve. So those are examples of mentors. And, you know, I also talk about, yesterday I talk about the young wives. And so I have a mentor, mm -hmm. mentor named Whitney Williams, who is a generation um, beneath me, and, and she keeps me cool and hip on technology and those type of things and trends. <laughs> right, and first mentor, yeah, no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah, um, I guess the, the, um, the last question I want to ask maybe has more to do with, um, you know, I was on the board of trustees of my alma mater, Amherst, for six years, and um, I was struck about the degree to which I feel like 
each president comes into an institution with, so it's a little bit like president of the United States. There's certain things that you want to try and accomplish, right? Right. And you can't do everything. So when you think about, um, you know, the Wooten presidency at Simmons, and you think about where the institution is today and where you would like it to be whenever that moment is that you, uh, you know, decide to do the next chapter in your career, what are some of the things that you, you want to see, or you would hope that people would take away from the impact of, you know, your, your leadership on the institution? Yeah, you know, my, my tweetable tagline is, is that, you know, when I think about my legacy, I want Simmons to be an extraordinary place to live, learn, and work. And, and let me unpack those three things. The learning part is, um, you know, it's, it's evident to people that, and we have these graduate and undergrad programs, but I want people to say, you know, if I'm a young woman or if I'm a graduate student, Simmons is the place I want to be because they do college learning so well. And I know I'm going to go there and be successful in my educational endeavors, but also in my leadership journey. So, though, so I want Simmons to be on the map from wherever it is in the world that everyone says, I need to come to Simmons once in my life, either for the leadership conference, for graduate education, our complete degree program, because it's just the place I have to be. And we have an educational product that's extraordinary. Um, being a great place to live is we're on a major real estate project now. And um, you and I know, you know, from your undergrad days and my undergrad days that dorm life is important. And so we're building a new living and learning community and bringing people together on one campus and unifying them so they have this transformational experience. And then, um, you know, we spend most of our life at work my faculty and my staff, and I want them to love their job and feel that they're being self-actualized from their job and that we're taking care of their well-being. So being an outstanding place to work is so important to me. And that's what I think about in my legacy. Okay, I, I'm gonna squeeze in one more. So obviously um, when you think about specifically the lens of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, are there any, uh, priorities, particular opportunities you see um, at Simmons to kind of make a difference or um, you know, make Simmons a, a leader in something that's happening in, in the higher ed space that's specifically yeah. related you know, to- Part of being a great place to work and transformational experiences, DEI is given for me, you know, similar to President Thomas who was on um, last month, I've been doing DEI work before it was, you know, hot and cool. So it's a given to me. <laughs> to create right. since, you know, 90, the early 90s to create cultures and places where diversity, equity, and inclusion matter. I want to make sure that Simmons is a place that people feel like they belong. And when students come, that we're leveling the playing field, that we're attracting those students where college is going to make a difference in their life and their income and their trajectory. So equity is so important for me and career readiness in that particular space. But I'm also committed that everybody who touches Simmons, students, faculty, staff, and alum, know the value of DEI. So I'll give you one example. We do a community read every semester. For this year, we looked at one of the books um, about the Flint water crisis and what that meant mm -hmm. for DEI and social justice. That was our fall reading, and we had Dr. Mona in. But then for the spring reading, we did how to be an anti-racist. And this was not only for students, faculty, and staff. We invited alum back. And so I see DEI as a lifelong journey. I'm always learning how to be better in this space for DEI and social justice. And want Simmons to be a place where people come to understand it, the trends, the tools, and how to be allies for various groups too. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And you know, one of the, I think the, the, the resonating themes across the conversation last month with President Thomas and with you, first right. of all, I'm, I'm struck by both the fact that both of you spent meaningful portions of your professional and academic lives thinking about organizations and how, how, how to shape them. And um, because I think, you know, the reality is if we're gonna move the dial on any of these issues, it really requires a certain organizational mindset shift. And, right. and I think it's, you know, it's an inspiring it for me to see, you know, folk, folks like you and a mentor like David who, come to the table to these roles and, you know, uh, as to your point, it's, it's just baked into the DNA of how you roll, so to speak. Um, and, you know, I just want to say how 
excited I am that you know you're in this position and and that to you is a partner of yours and you know we are you know at your side and trying to move the dial on this and make a difference to the world and and I feel like in terms of 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 uh, you know your leadership lessons I know there's a lot of people if you ever do any stuff more stuff on the S curve or any of those other things I'd love to figure out a way to showcase that and I want to thank you for for joining me on this new show, because um, without wonderful guests like you, we wouldn't be able to have these great conversations. You know, David, thank you for having me and thank you for having my mentor, President Thomas, last month. Um, it's just good to showcase the value of education and a role that it has in creating equity in society. Great. Well, I wish you the best. Get some rest this week and I, <laughs> I will talk to you soon. All right. Thank you, David. Thank you. Take care. Bye.